We're here to talk about knowing our worth, but the, the word I want to talk to you about first, because I think it connects everything that we do, is power. All right, so let's just think about power first, because, you know, and this week we've had the Lord's vote in response to Jasvinda Sangera's sexual harassment case against Lord Leicester. And that really brought home to me what power is, and when you've got it, and when you haven't. And, you know, we think about power in terms of representation, and we do a lot of work on that in terms of women in parliament, women in local government, and we will keep pushing on that because that's fundamental, getting women in there to make those decisions. But what we saw in that case was the real kind of closing ranks of the powerful and an institution effectively ganging up against a woman who has used a, a process that was the accepted process to challenge what she had experienced. And she'd been backed up by that process, and yet still that institution knocked her back, said no. And we had his friends lining up to vote in support of him. Now, how can we have a system that permits that? So, you know, we've got a long, long way to go till we realise equal power. And if we have equal power, we won't have that happening in our elected or unelected chambers, our sort of modern so-called democracy. Um, so thinking about representation, we've done a lot of work on representation this year. And our strategies for success research showed, this is our MPs research, showed not only are there still barriers to women coming into politics, but they meet active resistance and discrimination. And this presents us with real challenges, because obviously we've got to try and change all of that, but we're also saying to women, come and stand, come and be part of it. So I don't want to invite them into a system that's going to actively resist and discriminate against them. I want them to come into a system that's going to welcome them in. And so it's, it's a challenge for us to try and change that system while also bringing more women in at the same time. And we've also had the sexual harassment story, obviously, in the Commons recently with Laura Cox's investigation there. So we're, we're always riding this kind of two-horse message, which is problematic sometimes. But we're at it again on Wednesday. We've got 300 women coming with their MPs to Parliament on Wednesday. 50-50 have been the lead organisers, and we're a partner in that project. And it's to get women to come and be part of the change, because that fundamentally is the only way we're going to do it. Thinking about power in terms of money and financial independence is another really key theme for Fawcett, and obviously we're going to come to the equal pay discussion in a moment. But I just wanted to think about this concept of equal value, because sometimes you know, we, we often hear that people struggle with it. They don't understand equal value. They don't get how you can have two different jobs and rate them as equal. But, you know, the concept of equal value was first aired in the Treaty of Versailles, right? <laughs> Just after 1900, I can't remember the exact date. But the Treaty of Versailles, so they got it. They got the concept of equal value and they wrote it into that. And yet still, we're struggling with it. And we've got jobs that women do that are just not valued equivalent to men. And it's not because the jobs aren't valued, it's because the women aren't valued, right? So knowing our worth and getting that realisation, getting others to recognise and know our worth, is fundamental to driving that change. We know the gender pay gap has got many causes, and as Fiona's already mentioned, discrimination is definitely one of them. And I think what we've been concerned to do recently, and again, aided by Carrie's case and by Sam's case, which you're gonna hear a little bit about in a minute, is to really bring that home, because it's very hidden. It's very difficult to both prove a discrimination case, because you've got so many hurdles to go through before you can realize justice anyway, but also you just can't get to first base because you haven't got the information, you haven't got the data. How can you challenge if you don't know what your colleagues earn? And at the moment, the system we have doesn't open that up. Despite the progress of gender pay gap reporting, which forces employers to look at themselves, it doesn't give you the, the information which enables you to challenge. So we've still got a major problem with the lack of transparency on pay. And it's not just about equal pay, it's also about low pay. So we know women are, are overrepresented in low-paid work. We know low-paid work is disproportionately part-time. And our economy is actually structured on low-paid part-time work. It's a feature of the UK economy more than it is of other European economies. And we still have a minimum wage that isn't rated at the living wage rate. So if you're at the bottom, you're trapped in low pay, and then you're dependent on the interaction with the benefit system, which we know at the moment is also failing women. So women's work budget group research has shown that women 
have been disproportionately impacted by austerity, BME women in particular, and they're also particularly disadvantaged by welfare reform and universal credit, with single parents quite hard hit too. And then we've had the poverty rapporteur's uh, uh, remarks yesterday that UK government policy is penalising the poor, actively making it worse. So thinking again about power, we've also got to think about access to justice. So our, our sex discrimination law review highlighted some gaps. We're pushing for change on that. And one of the key areas that we want to change, which is difficult because it's a radical change, is about the balance of power between the organisation and the individual. So at the moment, we predicate our laws and our equality uh, entitlements on the individual's rights to challenge. We don't want to take that away, but we want to put more emphasis on the organisation's responsibilities to prevent discrimination and harassment in the first place. And we're getting support from the AHRC on that and also from the Women in Equality Select Committee. So we, uh, we think we may be getting somewhere in progressing that, but we have to keep that uh, focus to try and shift the balance between the two. Now, looking ahead, I just want to switch our focus now to equal pay because we're going to have a, a really fascinating discussion. You're going to hear from our keynote speaker, Carrie Gracie, in a minute. And I just want to tell you a little bit about the backstory to, to Carrie's donation and how we ended up running this new service with Yes Law, which I have to tell you, we are already getting inquiries into, we're already getting women coming through that service. We've been going for a week. So I'm really positive about that, and I urge you. I urge you to please spread the word. We've got a lot of work to do to really make women aware of that service. So, and I'm, we're not trying to substitute the role of trade unions, by the way. We recognise that trade unions have an important role, and we will signpost women to unions, and we will always say join a union. But there are many women who are not in trade unions and who don't have access to that support. So we do have to help them. It's aimed at women earning 30k a year or less. So we're aiming at low-paid women uh, and trying to help the, those who are less able to challenge. So going back to the, the point about how we got here, um, I, I remember having a meeting with Carrie and also then having a phone call with her afterwards where she told me that she wanted to do this. She wanted to make this donation to force it. And I have to say, I was in a state of complete shock when she told me how much it was and she told me what it was going to be because this is transformational stuff for us. In fact, I don't think in the history of the Fawcett Society, we've ever had a donation as big as this. So I can tell you one single donation. And as Fiona said, it's really fundamental to join up individual advocacy with campaigning because it makes you stronger, it informs your policy work, it informs your campaigning activity. The two knit really well together. But we're not trying to change who we are. We're working with Yes Law, our experts who are here, in the audience, they're the expert advisors, it's a partnership, and that's the best way to take it forward. And it's a settlement service, because that is how we can help women to negotiate with their employer and avoid the, the chaos that is our legal system at the moment, and a dysfunctional legal system it is at that. So, Carrie, I just want to echo what Fiona has already said. My heartfelt thanks to you, and it's been a real joy, not only getting the money, but <laughs> working with you has been such a joy because you're such an inspirational woman. And, you know, if anyone's, if, you, if there's one bit of evidence to a select committee I could urge you to watch, it's Carrie's testimony to the DCMS committee because she completely bowled them over. She was so convincing and compelling. And it's because she's been so clear that this is about the principle of equality and justice for women. It is not for her about the money. Although it's every penny of it she was entitled to keep it's about that core principle, and that is what we're fighting for, equality and justice for women. And we will keep fighting for that. And I can tell you, we are going to have a bigger 2019 and a more successful 2019 than we have had a 2018, and that is saying...